There's entire bot networks where I control all the infrastructure. So I have spent lots of time creating all of these paid and unpaid accounts. There's networks that literally put physical computers in different cities. There's one I know of that put physical computers and gave the computers to underrepresented people as free computers, like a charitable donation, but on the back end had bots that were running across multiple servers that were centrally controlled. So then it looks like real people coming from real addresses that have real transaction. It's a real company that owns it. It's a real song. I'm just like taking pennies by by streaming that song across as many streaming platforms as I can so that no one notices. What's going on? Welcome to the new music business. I'm your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business. The book, third edition, is out now everywhere. All versions, audiobook, ebook, hardcover, all that good stuff. Today, my guests are Andrew Beatty and Morgan Hayduck, and they are from BeatDap, and uh, this this company that that fights streaming fraud. This whole episode uh, is all about streaming fraud and what it is. And, and let me tell you, I thought I knew what it was before this episode, uh, before talking to these guys. And wow, is it far more intricate than I ever expected and ever even realized. And uh, kind of... I mean, <laughs> on one end, it's uh, it's actually very impressive what these fraudsters, these scammers are doing um, and how they're doing it. And we break down, they, they break down exactly how all of this is working and how they're catching them and why uh, they're motivated to do this and who's doing it and how all that works. We also talk about, you know, uh, when legitimate artists, because this happens to uh, a lot of legitimate artists, when they get their songs flagged for streaming fraud uh, and artificial uh, streams and, and all of that fraudulent activity, all of that stuff, that when they're not trying to scam the system, they're not trying to uh, participate in this, this streaming fraud. So we talk all about streaming fraud and what they're doing, uh, you know, but basically this company that they've, they've built works with most of the the DSPs, the streaming services, uh, a lot of labels, all of that. They do audits um, for the for streams, but they really they've gotten really, really, really good about catching fraudulent streams and fraudulent activity. And they discuss why, you know, no single streaming service is a, capable necessarily of doing it themselves and why they're kind of a lot better at, at catching this and doing all of this. This was a very fascinating conversation. I know you're really going to really going to enjoy this one. I learned a ton during this episode. And it's actually, um, you know, it's a it's a it's a good uh, follow up to a previous episode with Ryan Vaughn, where he talked about how he built an artist in a um, in a quote unquote legitimate way, not a fraudulent way, uh, use essentially hacking, uh, the streaming services and hacking Spotify to build the, his, um, artist. Um, and so if you haven't listened to that episode, I definitely encourage you to go back and listen to that episode with Ryan Vaughn, um, on how he's kind of hacked Spotify, uh, and TikTok with his artists. Um, so yeah, great episode. Uh, stick around to the end. Uh, we covered so much ground on this one. Uh, you can find Beat Dap, that's B E A T D A P P, uh, on the social platforms or on their website. Um, and uh, you can find Andrew and Morgan on LinkedIn and the social platforms as well. You can find all of us that make the show happen at Ari's Take on Instagram and TikTok and Threads and X, Twitter, I guess. Uh, yeah, I still haven't figured out what, 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 uh, Elon is calling that app now, but you know, the app formerly known as Twitter, I suppose, uh, we're still there. I yeah. Uh, you can find me at Ari Hurston on Instagram and, and threads once in a while and Twitter, I guess when I'm following the Dodgers, but that's about it. Um, visit Ari's take.com, get on that email list. That's where you're going to get the most up-to-date relevant info about the new music business. Ari's take.com, get on the email list, but uh, pause the show right now, hit that subscribe, hit that follow button. If you haven't followed, if you haven't subscribed, you want the show to come up in your feed uh, when we release new episodes and uh, leave us a five-star review on Spotify and Apple podcasts or however you listen to this podcast. If you're listening on YouTube, watching on YouTube, give us a thumbs up, subscribe, that helps. Uh, love reading the comments, all that good stuff. All right, let's kick into the show. Andrew and Morgan, welcome to the show. 
Thanks okay, for having, having us. us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, cool. So uh, streaming fraud is a, is a real hotbed topic these days. And you guys are kind of some of the experts right now in the space to discuss it. But before we get into the nuts and bolts of all of that, um, you know, you guys have a interesting background. Um, and I would love for for each of you just to kind of share like, you know, the 30 second version of, of just kind of like what brought you to this moment here and why we're why we're talking today. And just kind of give us a, a little little foundation of, of who you are. Um, Morgan, why don't you kick us off? Awesome. Uh, yeah, so I started my career in uh, consulting. And my first client was the music industry in Canada. And so one of our files was extending copyright protection uh, from 50 to 70 years to align with some of the other global standards. Uh, and so I got introduced, aside from being just a terrible guitar player um, and loving music my whole life, I got introduced to the business of music through uh, copyright, which is just a bit of a soup sandwich, but a really interesting way to learn. Um, and so I, I started there, uh, ended up in tech. Uh, Andrew and I went to grad school together many, many years ago. I always knew we wanted to build something together and music is sort of a shared passion and something about, you know, building something in the music business kept pulling us back. So um, started in copyright, ended up in technology, blended those two things together. And, you know, between Andrew and I, BDAP was the uh, was the offshoot. Cool. Andrew, how about you? Yeah, I actually started my career in artist, uh, like breaking artists, artist promotion. So I really started early. I started building Facebook tech in 2006 and seven when it was still EDU based. Uh, and really focusing on how to use social media way ahead. I remember companies back then telling me Facebook's for kids and they wouldn't get involved. And like, like so pretty early days. And mm-hmm. I was the guy you would go to to hack like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, if you wanted to get on the front page of YouTube, that kind of stuff. So I was really mm-hmm. early in artist promotion, breaking artists. I then went and did a number of tech companies. So I built and sold four other companies. And uh, Morgan and I met, like I said, like he's mentioned in grad school. Yeah. And I swear I'd never go back to music. And so but when this thing came about, I was like, oh, the music tech side sounds more interesting. Like, I, I'd, I'd go back on that side. And then we decided to kind of launch BeatDap together. So that's how I ended up here. Cool. And what inspired launching BeatDap? I mean, we had a lot of conversations with folks from our past life about just some of the data related challenges in music. And, you know, some of this is like tale as old as time. I think when you start talking about solving metadata problems in music, people's either eyes glaze over or they think about all the companies that have tried and failed along the way and just how difficult that is. Um, we, we actually saw a slightly different problem than the one we're now solving, which was around the auditability of, of streaming services and some of the challenges that that presents just dealing with the scale of data that's coming off of all these platforms globally. Um, mm-hmm. And what was interesting is we, as we dug deeper into the audit problem, fraud just sort of presented itself to us. Uh, and so we were fortunate to have an entry point with some folks at labels that we'd worked with in the past and got exposed to some of the challenges that they were dealing with. And just as we dug deeper on the platform side, we started to realize, oh, okay, there's a sort of first principle problem of, of adjudicating legitimacy before you can deal with the sort of accounting and reconciliation side of the business, which is also a challenge. And so we mm-hmm. found fraud exploring a, a sort of a different product and a different problem um, and you know, thankful for yeah. it in some ways because it led us to the, led us to here. Yeah. And Andrew, I, I feel like you've had a little bit more of an intimate relationship uh, with, uh, I, let's, let's call it hacking uh, this, the kind of, <laughs> of the services. And maybe you've seen this side from a less of a analytical standpoint. Uh, Morgan was uh, kind of just gave us a, a real nice, um, Kind of company line there, but I, I wanna I wanna hear where you come at this. Um, from my limited research, I feel like you have a different perspective. Yeah, I mean, I the difference here is that back when I was like quote unquote hacking, uh, mm-hmm. which was really just about exposure, there yep. was still needing to be product market fit. Like your song, if it sucked, there's nothing I could do for you. Like yeah. we launch a song and uh, the consumer decides they like it or they don't. I'm just getting you in front of the consumers, but it's still an active decision from the consumer to like you. And back those days, you're talking about 2006 to 11. Mm-hmm. It's still largely download based. We were selling behind the scenes, customized apps, which are basically Instagram destroyed. Uh, and so like all of this, like, like new tech that was sort of emerging. I mean, ringtones, like crazy stuff right. that like no right. one thinks about today. Um, 
So again, the, the customer had to like you, but the, the tactics are very similar to the toxic tactics that could be used today on, you know, for streaming manipulation. And so okay. what's interesting about it is that, you know, I, I did all kinds of crazy stuff back then, uh, but it wasn't like financially motivated. It was almost all perception motivated because okay. again, like whether or not you had a million fans on Facebook was irrelevant if they're not buying something from you. What's right. interesting about today is like the way they're hacking it is no one actually has to actively like you. Uh, they can run bots and sort of account takeovers and networks and steal the money. There was no money on my side other than just like hoping that the the opportunity would help you break and that people yeah. actually would want your, your content. But I mean, nine out of 10 times, it wouldn't work. Like I could yeah. go on the front page of YouTube and like you'd have a bunch of down thumbs and uh, really negative comments and there's nothing I could do about that if your product was bad but if your product was yeah. great you could totally take off and so I, t I take you're right I'm, I have more of the tactical view of you know I'm that I'm probably uh, everyone's favorite hacker on the on the on the on this side of the line you know I, I never did the fraud the actual fraud component I would say but that's the um, the tactics are very similar and I think that allows me to think in a, in a probably different way than most other people. So let's talk about what streaming fraud is, um, you know, for people that just are not familiar with how this works or that it even exists. Uh, break it down for me. What is it? Yeah, so we bucketed two primary motivations. It's either trying to just take royalties out of the streaming ecosystem, right? So you, whether you're a Superman three or an office space fan, we're all familiar with the idea of like skipping micro pennies out of a, out of a big pool of money and uh, sure. streaming presents that sort of same opportunity, the way that PayPal and digital advertising and you know, digital banking and all of these other digital industries have sort of that have been ripe for fraud. Music is no different. It's a big pot of money on the internet. And there are huge groups of motivated bad actors who just look at it and go, we can extract some of that. So about 80% of what we see is, is motivated purely by the financial opportunity. Can you What's interesting me, about me? Before you yeah. get into the next, uh, can you give me an example uh, specifically of like yeah. what that looks like? How does that even happen? I'm a, I'm a hacker or I'm, I'm, a, I'm a scammer, let's say, and I'm, okay. I want to make money. So I just need to get songs. It doesn't matter where they come from. It could be AI generated songs, which make my life sometimes easier. It could sure. be a struggling artist that sell me their song for $100 or $50. I just need passable, mediocre songs. I load them through DIY platforms onto streaming services everywhere, ideally as many as possible. And then mm -hmm. what I do is I create and or leverage some sort of bot network or accounts that I have access to to then play my version of the song. Now I need to hide what I'm doing. So ideally it's in a playlist or if I'm account, if I'm stealing Morgan's account, like to hack, like I don't actually have to steal Morgan's account. There's professional scammers out there who quite literally just offer up accounts just as easy as I buy space on Amazon. I'm like, Hey, I need 400,000 X streaming service accounts and they're available and they've hacked them. They have all the credentials. I rent them from some hacker for an hour, turn them on and say, go play my song 10 oh. times. And so what happens is Morgan's regular listening throughout the day looks as if it's normal. He just happened to play my song a few times throughout the day. And so what's happening is I load, there's a DIY platform. We all know we use lots of them. We load our, this music up. Then I go to one of these other services and I basically rent and or build a network to stream the songs. And then I get paid and I can get paid in any jurisdiction I want because I'm telling it, hey, this song is owned in France or this song is owned in Columbia, this song's owned in the United States, and that money can move however I want it to move to be extracted. It's a real mm -hmm. company that owns it. It's a real song. I'm just like taking pennies by by streaming that song across as many streaming platforms as I can so that no one notices. And wow. I don't want to break out. I don't want to be a top 10 song. I don't want to be recognized. I want to sit in that middle to long tail so no one recognizes me. So huh. sometimes we'll catch a network with 100,000 accounts that are all verified, registered, paid users. And they're playing the song one time per day in concert with each other Whoa. across multiple different platforms. And those little tiny numbers add up. Ah, so this isn't just um, bots that are streaming. Uh, they're not like just hiring uh, like bot accounts, right, to stream this. You're saying that that, that some of these companies are actually hacking into people's various Spotify or Apple music accounts or whatever and getting and all they're doing by hacking into their accounts is getting them to stream 
these songs a couple times a day or whatever it is. Um, so they're actually from real people. Now, is there another version of this where is like, what is that the only kind of, is this, is this kind of how streaming fraud works right now or is, or does it work uh, no, other ways? There's do, so do? there's, there's entire bot networks where I control all the infrastructure. So I have spent lots of time creating all of these paid and unpaid accounts. Uh, there's networks that literally put physical computers in different cities. Like there's one I know of that put physical computers and gave the computers to uh, underrepresented people as free computers, like a charitable donation, but on the mm -hmm. back end had bots that were running across multiple servers that were centrally controlled. So then it looks like real people coming from real addresses that have real transaction. But they don't realize there's a back door. Wow. Um, and so like that's, and they, and then they can mimic like an artist, for example, going on tour. So they start in DC and then they move to Baltimore and then they're down in Miami. And it's like this whole fake elaborate thing that's just generating a fake movement or momentum, uh, all generating streams. And so like there's, they're quite elaborate that way. We caught another one where someone had launched an artist that looked exactly like a named artist you would recognize. Um, the album cover metadata except the payee was different and uh, they launched on the same day. And it's not uncommon for a streaming service, for example, to have multiple IFRCs for the same song, depending on how it's packaged. So they normally concatenate it and they and, and they canonize it. And like one is the one that wins and the rest are kind of under it as a parent-child relationship. Well, mm -hmm. if that version was hit with bots, sometimes the algorithm looks like, oh, that's the one we should promote. And then it starts putting it in all the algorithmic playlists. So in this case, another like scammer had launched an album on the same day and time as the real artist. It, it actually charted for the artist. It looks like the artist, but the pay is different. And they extracted massive amounts of money from that artist over a long period of time without anyone noticing. And once we found it, we said, how many other artists has this happened to? And we found 1,700 other artists that had had a similar attack on the same platform. And so again, that's like a very unique type of scam that they had pulled off. And they had basically hijacked the revenue from a real artist that we would all know today. Let me just let me just see if I got this got this right here, because uh, right now you're yeah you're opening uh, pathways that have have not been opened yet for me, um, which which is, doesn't happen too frequently. But let me uh, let me just see if I understand this correctly. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm I'm going to use an example. I don't know this artist that you're talking these artists that you're talking about. So I'm just going to make these artists make one up. I'm going to use these examples. Use one. So okay. So you're saying like, uh, let's say for instance, this is, um, um, you know, Bad Bunny's coming out with a new uh, single. And what you're saying is that a scammer uh, is able to, or someone else is able to use a, DIY, use a DIY distributor, release a single by the artist Bad Bunny, and then uh, it will it will be the same same name it just has a different isrc it's going to go on to bad bunny's actual artist profile um and then it's going to um and and then it's just going the streaming service might prioritize that track over the other one and it's now is it the same audio file it's the same they literally like download i don't it know so how like, they get it they get the same audio. They'll get like a, they'll recreate album of like, it'll look exactly the same look in, in these cases, yeah. except it had a different in, in the pay, like who's being paid and who actually owns the pay, the payout. It is different. So the distributor is different and who gets paid is different, but everything else looks the same. So if you're just looking at aggregated data as bad bunnies manager, you're like, Oh, we're doing great numbers. It looks right. like it. Uh, you know, everyone's picking the song up. It's great. But you don't realize because you get paid so much so late, like yeah. that this money has actually been extracted th from a different wow. channel. Right. Because it's um, I mean, because there isn't uh, a set rate for what you're going to earn from streams like there was in the download era. It's really hard to audit that because it's like, oh, if I got a million downloads on iTunes. I know that's going to be seven hundred thousand dollars or so about that right and I, I can do that math because apple takes a 30 percent it was like okay that's super easy to audit <laughs> but streaming the rates are all over the place whether somebody uh has streamed your song with a paid account in the u.s versus an ad account in australia or india or whatever those rates are so dramatically different that you don't really know i could see okay i have 
you know, I have uh, 100 million streams, I have no idea what that's going to earn me. And if that earns me, you know, um, I don't know, $10 million, that sounds reasonable. If that earns me 100,000, ah, that sounds a little low, but who knows? I don't know, you know? And so like what you're saying is like, these people come in and they're able to pull out a few of that, just like a, a little bit of that money. So how do you catch something like this? And how, like, what are you, I, you guys are, are part of the crew, I, I suppose, uh, to, to like audit this and understand that this is existing. And then like, how do you even, yeah, yeah how do you catch this? You know, the, the example Andrew just gave was one where we weren't looking for fake or or uh, improper use of existing copyright. Like we're not we're not listening to the audio files and going, oh, this is you know this is that same artist but under a different payee. Um, right. We found it because the behavior of the users listening to that artist was indicative of fraud. So that what we're saying there is right. like the, the, this cohort of users that are listening to these seventeen hundred different artists on this platform are all behaving in a way that suggests coordination and, you know, some bot-like attributes, whether that's multiple device types across multiple regions in too short of a period of time, too high of play counts. I mean, there's basically hundreds of features that go into the models and what gets spit out is a sort of confidence score that, yes, this is a legitimate user or this is a suspicious user. And, and with a high degree of sort of confidence, this user is a bot or this user's account has been stolen. And these are the plays that were the stolen sort of part of the equation. These are the legitimate user plays. So we were looking at the, in that case, the characteristics and the behaviors of a cohort of users. And they led us to all of this content that was being improperly used. But it mm. started in that case from a user level analysis. We'll also do song level analysis and artist level analysis. And in some cases, device as well. So we're looking at it from three or four different perspectives. And then underneath each of those perspectives is a whole series of models, taking in a whole bunch of different platform features and data points. Um, but yeah, it's oftentimes like it, what's cool is the, the behavior of a user can lead you to something that's actually kind of a bigger discovery, right? Like we, yeah. we found a whole new sort of threat vector because a group of users behaved in a particularly weird way. Um, and all of a sudden it led us to you know, a massive amount and of And it's like whack-a-mole, right? Like they're always, right. to Morgan's point, they're always changing their tactics. So we're constantly looking for new attack vectors, then updating models. We'll see people test stuff out early on a small platform and then try to scale it across larger platforms. Uh, hmm. And so like one of the benefits of being across so many platforms is we can see, okay, this is happening. Let's build, let's build a model to detect it early across everybody. So as soon as it starts hitting, we're catching it. Um, hmm. And so like, yeah, they're, they're always, it's, it's, I enjoy it cause it's fun. The creativity they have is like sometimes <laughs> like we joke about having like a fraudy awards where like everyone shows up in a mask and we provide people like this is the most creative hack we've seen this year uh oh my God. you know because <laughs> it's wild the stuff they do for the, for the third year in a row accepting an absentia uh the winner <laughs> yeah. of the fraudies <laughs> seriously wow i mean it, it does take a lot of uh ingenuity and creativity uh to i mean these these scams are ingenious i mean you know um, I had uh, I had the Billboard writer Kristen Robinson on the show a little bit uh, ago talking about the the YouTube scammers who kind of yeah. scammed a lot of these Latin uh, record labels, but it was mostly like skimming off this like YouTube revenue and a similar kind of a well, it had their own scam version, you know. But um, and they finally got caught, but they they took like millions i mean you know like 20 30 million dollars yeah. or something like that in youtube just just youtube royalties um yeah. are you covering youtube as well or are you only looking at uh audio only streaming services like like the the you know spotify apple music title deezer etc at amazon we do we do a bunch of buckets so we have like the typical streaming services you would see we have other use cases that you can look at like fitness applications where sometimes their the royalties are paid out based on how it's played like Peloton. there's other app Peloton. like yeah or yeah exactly or like there's some applications that change the tempo of music based on how you're you're like exercising and stuff like that and there's different things there um we also have some clients uh, on the AI generative side where they're like, Hey, we don't want our content to be used as fraud. So we would like to catch the fraud before it ever gets uploaded to the DSP side. So on their mm -hmm. side, we actually analyzing their user behavior to see 
which of their users look like fraud and then blocking them before they ever have the ability to download the track or upload it to a DSP through their D- through their distributor. So we're, mm. we're helping on that side, some music collection societies and, and sort of like uh, the typical like publishing and collection because they might not get a fraud report for a year. And if they've paid that money out, all of a right. sudden, like how do you call that back from real artists or how are you going to tell a bunch of artists, hey, we accidentally overpaid the wrong people. So like there's sort of a collective credit against all of your money next year. Uh, yeah. like, you're not going to get paid for, you know, and it's it's a weird situation. So we're trying to just own fraud and all the vectors we can when it comes to music streaming for fraud and just help all of these different layers, um, mm. you know, distributors, collectors, uh, pure DSPs, other other types of, of collections, stuff like that. So we're kind of f- all over that. Yeah, I feel like, I mean, isn't the onus on the streaming services to solve this problem? Like, why, why do you exist? <laughs> Clearly, they haven't done a good job of it, I suppose. And it's like, is that the exit strategy? Like, for one of these companies to like, I mean, I just it just like seems like that they should be doing this. It's just like surprising that they're not. It's cutting straight to the heart of it. Um, yeah. No, it, it's, <laughs> Come on. It, it's a good question. It's, it's exactly the right question. So look, we, I don't think it's the, the streaming services do some work in this space. All of them, you know, big and small to, you know, greater and lesser extents, but they're all working on the problem. But let's look at a different industry for the analogy that I think makes, you know, makes the reason for our business to exist make sense. We look at the financial services industry where, you know, anti-money laundering and transaction level fraud is common and pervasive. And you would not expect JP Morgan and Wells Fargo to be sharing customer level data back and forth with one another to Mm. inform their internal models on, you know, fraud that's going beyond their bank. But it's really helpful to see beyond your four walls and understand what the patterns look like across other platforms in the same space. And so in financial services, there's a great company, Canadian company. We're not just vlogging it because it's Canadian, but it helps. Um, But uh, called Verifin. And they do this. They sit across multiple banks, you know, customer level data sets build models trained on the most robust possible data set with the most features and the most information um, and report back to all of the banks in a way that they would never be able to do amongst themselves because they're sharing Mm -hmm. hyper, they're, they're they're maintaining a database of hypersensitive customer information and just sharing what's relevant back with competitors and still letting the banks compete head to head with one another, um, you know, in the marketplace for customers. Streaming is very similar, right? You'll never expect Spotify, Apple, Amazon, SoundCloud, Tidal and Deezer to open up a shared customer database of all of their streaming activity right. uh, for so many reasons. But it really helps if they can see across one another's platforms in a very narrow, specific way, which is like, what are the patterns of fraud that are being used on one that might be showing up here? And can mm-hmm. we start to chart what that looks like across platforms in a more efficient way when we're seeing multiple parties' data sets? So mm-hmm. like, when we think about the reason for our business, it's because someone has to play that sort of neutral Switzerland air traffic control role. Makes sense. And by virtue of having more customers, our models get more efficient. We're able to do this more effectively. We just become a, a mm. sort of a better outsourced solution than what you could reasonably build internally. The mm. one other point I think is worth making here is that it, for the sort of the end goal or what you said to like the end strategy, I don't think any one of the platforms buys us because suddenly we'd be in the same position as if the platform tried to sell its own service to its competitors. We have right. to be neutral. Yep. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. I was going to say there's an alignment issue too. And like the sense that no one in the industry, because everything's based most of the industry on rev share of royalties, like no one downstream, like distributors shouldn't be owning this problem. Like mm-hmm. other, there's sh- no one should be owning this because they all have an inherent in like, uh, misalignment around catching fraud if you're a distributor and 50 percent of your streams are fraudulent like are you really going to cut 50 percent of your revenue to fight streaming fraud sure. and like that's a number we see often we see like 40 to 60 percent of some really large distributors like streams are fraudulent and Whoa. on the platforms we sit across so if you're putting them in charge like are you really going to let them like decide what's fraud and not fraud yeah, uh, because it sense. definitely impacts and the alignment's not there. So you really need no one on our cap table is a music industry strategic or part of the music. Like we are completely neutral from all yep. of the ownership out. And I think that's really important. And we've made, it's been, that was the hardest path for us to take because in the beginning, everyone in the music industry wanted to give us money. And we said, we can't take your money. Otherwise it ruins the position we want to be in the future. And we were very, very diligent about not, not compromising that. And so yes. we are like 
truly neutral and we don't care which way it goes because it's whack-a-mole it's constantly going to be happening we just want the numbers to be accurate and and Mm -hmm. there's just a misalignment from anyone in the industry who participates in the upside um of streams to then sort of be the police and and to morgan's point i don't think the dsps want to be the fbi of streaming like they want to deliver the best content (laughs) and user experience you know like they're not trying to like be the cops yeah, no, no, that that makes a lot of sense. And and I, I mean, I really appreciate that uh, you have been diligent about uh, who your investors are and who you have to answer to. You know, there was a lot of pushback. Uh, I mean, with Spotify, you know, uh, inviting, well, not necessarily inviting, but, but uh, early on, the only way they were, it was rumored that they were allowed to launch in the U.S. was because the three big majors uh, invested in Spotify, and so like there's this conflict of interest um, that kind of pitted the, you know, uh, n- not all artists on Spotify are equal because the majors are part owners. They're obviously going to look out for their own best interests, and so now the indies are over here, kind of just like, well, why are we getting the short end of the stick? It's like, well, because the majors are part owners of this streaming service and it's a complete conflict of interest. Um, so yeah, so I, I appreciate that. And it makes perfect sense that uh, you need to be in the middle here. So uh, what is your business model? Who are your customers? Uh, you don't have to tell me the names, but like, what is that? Like, I don't understand wh- how the this streaming, works. We, anyone that's asking us to evaluate all of their users for fraud. So typically the streaming services uh, are okay. first and they'll give us hundreds of data fields. So we have like gyroscope, battery life, all the in-app activity they did as they were clicking through songs to decide what to play. Like we're getting massive amounts of first party data from these providers and then analyzing it across hundreds and hundreds of machine learning models, supervised, unsupervised to detect different types of fraud and constantly reevaluating and improving. And so like with those, we charge them typically a cost per million streams analyzed and they pay us a sort of a, a rate based on how many streams they're doing as a volume. That's that's typically our uh, you know our core customer and how and how we we charge them. And what's interesting is for them, it's sort of like a cost for doing business to be good partners. There's also an added benefit that they pay the people out correctly, so they don't get sued for you know uh, royalties being wrong. Uh, and then on top of that, as you start moving fraud off platform, you start saving a lot of cloud costs because you're not delivering songs to bots that aren't actually listening. Mm. So. Um, you know, last year, for example, on the streaming services we were on, we shifted market share back to rights owners. That includes independents, everybody, by around 20%. So you're talking about wow. making 20% more just from, you know, the just from correcting the fraud. Because to Morgan's point earlier, 80% is financially motivated. It's not real artists. It's not right. like artists trying to break out. It's not artists trying to maintain. It's legitimately people who are not part of our industry who are just like seeing it as a soft yes. target. And so that's what we, you know, we hope to remove. And we did like last year, again, on the services we were on, we moved market share considerably back in favor of all artists. And, and, and we're talking I, I billions wanna, of dollars a year is what's being stolen. Uh, and I want to, I want to clarify what that actually means and how that works. Um, and just to pause there for a second to explain uh, the payment model, um, I'll, I'll explain it and then you you interject and correct me if I'm wrong, but like because the majority of the streaming services operate on a pro rata uh, payment model, it, it meaning that, you know, um, if I pay $10 uh, for my streaming service subscription this month, my $10 goes to the streaming service. It doesn't go necessarily to the artists I listen to. All the, the $10 of uh, everyone who pays subscription goes into this essential black box. And then the streaming services pay out based on market share of those streams. So like we're using the Bad Bunny example. If I pay $10 this month and I didn't listen to Bad Bunny at all this month, he still probably got a little bit of my $10 subscription fee because he's got some of the most streams on the platform and, and the biggest market share. So what you're saying is that these scammers essentially are trying to get a bit of that market share so they get paid out some of these streams because that is how this the uh, payment structure works right now. Now, I'm curious your take on uh why don't we just switch to a user centric payment model uh where my ten dollar subscription would go to only the artist that I listen to this month, not to Bad Bunny if I'm not listening to him. And if I only listen to one artist, that one artist gets all ten of my dollars less uh the streaming services commission of you know 30% or whatever. Why do, doesn't that just solve the problem? 
That's where the hacker in me comes out, you know, like, cause like it's, it's, uh, you you know, (laughs) uh, (laughs) user centric solves a lot of problems. Like we, we're actually not opposed to user centric at all. Um, but it won't solve the fraud problem because a large percentage of fraud we see is what's called account takeovers. You'll often hear it called ATOs where like 90% of all internet logins across the whole internet is just fraudsters trying to see if passwords and and usernames work. So on every website across the internet, 90% of all logins globally are just people attempting. So like you had your uh, enterprise car rental login hacked and they're just like, Oh, I wonder where else that works. There's running around testing it on everything they can find. And so what that means is there's a large number of people who just have their accounts because how secure is your, your streaming service? Like, do you really, it's not, you you don't care about it the same way you care about your banking. And so like, that's like the lowest level of probably security for password and username that you can think of. And it's funny, like someone told us once that the average logins for, for Facebook is 18 months, which tends to coincide with new phones. So you get a new phone and you have to re-log in. And so it's the same thing. Like no one thinks to like change that stuff. And so right. account takeovers are actually easy. So the, the hacker in me loves this because basically instead of having to generate – the best way to think about it is if I want to make Morgan famous, I can't just stream Morgan or it's a giant arrow back to me. I have to yeah. stream Morgan and 100 other million songs so they don't know that I'm actually targeting Morgan. With yeah. an account takeover, Morgan's naturally doing that for me. So I actually only need to stream the fraud part. So it's actually way cheaper and easier for me to go steal accounts and say, hey, on a pro rata, for example, the average user might listen to 100 songs a week. So now mm-hmm. I just have to play 10 songs to get a dollar. To get a dollar yeah. in the other way, I might have had to play 30,000 tracks or 30,000 like uh, streams. So it's right. way cheaper and easier for me to steal accounts in a user-centric model for revenue with a cat with that specific attack vector than it is for me to have to run all the bots out around it the other way yeah the value of a single stream in if you're if you stream one song a month in a user-centric model the value of that one stream is 10 bucks which is you know uh great for folks who want to go find dormant accounts on a platform and stream far less and make far more Man, it's like, yeah, no, I get it. And it makes sense. It's just really frustrating because it's just like, you know, as indie artists out here, we're like, I mean, the user centric payment model makes so much more sense just if we're not talking about fraud, uh, because it's just like, you know, it's really hard for artists to make a living and make revenue uh, when they only have super fans and they're not um, placed in a bunch of playlists on the platform and they're not like you know juiced by the algorithm they're not like winning the algorithmic game or the the you know uh but they have a bunch of super fans and that that's the issue right now it's like in this streaming era it's like an artist might have you know ten thousand super fans uh but those ten thousand you know that might stream them I don't know, 10 times a month or whatever, but like those hundred thousand streams are really not enough to make a living on. Whereas like if those 10,000 people previously, you know, bought their records or just like, if there was a different, you know, downloaded their stuff, it just, you can make a lot more money from your super fans traditionally, historically pre-streaming. But you know, it goes the other way. It's just like, yes. And now we're seeing a lot of uh, artists that kind of break out Maybe they don't have fans, but they are making a really good living from streaming. They're not fraudsters, but because like I just had uh, Ryan Vaughn on the on the podcast and he talked about his uh, one of his artists. uh, He's a manager and a distributor um, and a kind of a label manager. One of his artists is the solo piano kind of cover artist. And like this guy makes like solo organic acoustic piano covers and releases in like 10 songs a month and has been doing that for three years and has essentially gamed the system in a legit non hacker, non streaming or non fraud way. It's yeah. like real music. He's a real artist and he just pumps up in all this music. Now this guy's got no fans, but millions make millions of streams a month. And so this guy is making actually a really good living in this pro rata model by getting all of his songs included in these playlists and the algorithm has juiced him up and like all these, you know, chill, you know, piano, you know, meditation, yoga playlists, whatever, you know, his songs are in there now because he's, he's essentially 
hacked the algorithm and hacked the system there. Um, so yeah, it's just like, it's, it's hard times out here for artists <laughs> and, uh, and labels and everything like that. And, and, um, yeah, go ahead, Morgan. Yes, I, well, well, we think we can no, solve that, right? Yeah. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Morgan. No, I was, was going to say, it's, you know, we come at this like with a fairly narrow lens. And, and the one thing when we talk about the various economic models, it's, it's pretty important to like, we have thoughts about all of them, but the ones that we're really super sort of comfortable speaking to is how, where they intersect with fraud. That's not the yeah. only consideration for an economic model. And ultimately, our view is we just don't want people to think of one model as a silver bullet over another when it comes to solving the problem that we're sure. working on. Um, and I think our view is that no matter what, you know, the industry implements, and maybe it's different economic models for different platforms, maybe it's differential pricing at some point, whatever it is, as long as there's a great big pot of money on the internet that's sitting behind a consumer facing app, there's going to be motivated <laughs> folks out there trying to suck some of that money out for bad reasons. And that's what we're going to focus on. And so I think like, because I think you're making a really good point, like for artists, and I think they think about artist centric and or user centric and, and wonder if this is a better sort of model for them because they have a passionate group of super fans, but it's small. That could be true. Yeah. Like it's, it's uh, yeah. and, and if that's the case, and if it ends up being that everyone in the industry finds a model that works collectively for, you know, indie and major and everyone's benefit, um, we'll be right there to just make sure that that's protected. I think that's the sort of, for us, the central thesis mm -hmm. of what we do. Um, we'll work around whatever model comes, um, you know, sure. comes to be the dominant one. Can you help me uh, understand um, how legitimate songs from legitimate artists get taken down? Uh, this happens all the time, unfortunately, um, where artists um, get flagged by the streaming service for fraudulent activity or whatever, and their songs get taken down. And then the artists are like, what the hell? I didn't like I'm not scamming that like what's going on here? And uh, can you explain why that happens? I think um, the two ways that come to mind right off the bat is, and one thing I think we're very good at. So to be clear, before we call something fraud with platforms, we actually have to be like absolutely confident. We like, so we do not want to penalize any super fans or any artist that's decided to break out in a different way. So after we've called it fraud internally, we actively look to disprove our own bias and find ways. So what types of touring are there on? Are there other third party reasons why this song could have taken off? Like we need to be extremely confident that this stuff's not fraud before we claim it. We'd rather, we, we have the lowest false positives possible for that reason. So with that said, the thing, two things I think that could happen is you're a very creative artist and you find some cool way to market your music and it just looks yep. abnormal. Like all of a sudden you've broken out, but it doesn't meet any of the sort of previous things you've done. And it looks like a real outlier that seems suspicious. So that like, if you have a really strict model, it becomes just easy to say, Hey, this feels weird. This isn't normal. So I think sometimes being too creative could hurt you. And that, and because it's hard to explain like why all of a sudden you've just broke out with 2 million streams in a day. And it could have been right. something as crazy as like, you know, some college community found you and went viral and just didn't get picked up or maybe you sure. were on college radio, or whatever it was. Um, and so like, there's, there's things like, or TikTok commonly, but there's like, you know, explainable reasons that we could look for to, to find that. The other, I would say more common thing is the artist doesn't realize that in their marketing promo package, like they've just hired the wrong people and people will legitimately tell you, Oh no, these are all real people. We have like, we have a direct relationship with these fans and they like these artists and they use logos and names that look familiar. And they're like, Hey, we're, we're trusted. And so you hire a marketing firm to help on one aspect. And in the background, they're then hiring the bots and you mm. don't realize that they then are not actually de delivering what they promised. I think that's actually the much more, much more common case yeah. where yeah. you're an independent artist or you're an artist and you hire someone who you believe is legitimate and they end up not being legitimate. And then when you see the proof, if you ever have the opportunity, like sometimes we'll get these from a DSP, we'll see them and it's like, hey, your fan group, went, this artist's independent fan group went from, you know, 60% iOS and 40% Android or, you know, 38% Android and 2% web to 99% web on Linux, which is like nobody <laughs> uses. Uh, and you're just like, like yeah. once they see that the artist immediately knows, like, obviously that wasn't, that wasn't right. 
And I think right. they become the collateral damage because these yeah. marketing services are not being truthful around how they're actually generating streams. True. Yeah, no, I mean, and I tested that, you know, I, um, as I have a few different artist projects and I manage some artists and, you know, I, it's, it's like, I use a lot of the, my own stuff as the guinea pig to test a lot of these services out. And, and years ago, I mean, this is, this is not a new phenomenon here. Like I, I, um, hired a playlist plugging service six or seven years ago, I want to say, um, and that they promised me that it was all legit playlist that they are partnered with and it was real people and yada 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 uh you can guess how the story ends my <laughs> album got taken down from spotify <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? and like you know and it was like oh wow like streams are going this is cool and it's just like working and i'm like oh i'm getting all these playlists and then boom it got flagged and got ripped down i'm like what the like what the hell like this is my, this is actually real music my real album i hired a marketing agency that i thought was going to like plug me into real playlists because that was the way to do it six seven years ago so like yes and i have real empathy for these artists that just like you know are trying to figure out what they're supposed to do how do you market and promote your music right now which is fucking hard yeah. and like you know and now we're having to compete with these actual really good hackers and fraudsters, which we're not even trying to compete with. Like, I shouldn't have to worry about them. Like, there's no legitimate reason that they should be part of the same pot of money and like the whole industry that we're part of. Like, it's hard enough to just compete with the other artists and labels out there for some of that, let alone these, you know, bots hackers. or like hackers. Scammers. Yeah. yeah. Scammers. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> but so anyway. True. Um, so what are like, uh, what are the solutions? Like, what, what are you guys, uh, you know, other than this whack-a-mole or is that the solution? You're just getting better at whack-a-mole. Uh, is there like something that you would like to see happen? Like, all right, we've already established, uh, that user centric payment wouldn't solve all streaming fraud or it would solve a lot of it and it would it'd be helpful for a lot of artists and everything else. But it wouldn't solve all streaming fraud because they can hack everybody's accounts and do just like we've established. Um, do you see any other solutions that would help solve this problem? Uh, or what are you working on? Yeah, for us, it's, you know, get better, be more efficient, be able to catch things faster and, in, in, you know, really in shorter periods of time so that not only do we not end up passing fraud through into sales reports, which affects the payouts for all the legitimate artists, but also let's make sure that, you know, in the case of fraud that shows up in algorithmic playlists or charts that gets weeded out early too. So for us, it's an efficiency thing. How fast, how big, you know, how big can we get? How many customers can we bring on board? How fast can we detect this and how quickly can we make sure it's removed from every place where it becomes visible in the industry, whether that's playlists, charts, or ultimately flowing through to sales reports. Um, I think that's sort of the, the, the sort of the big question. They're, like going back to what we talked about at the beginning, the sort of two different motivations for fraud. Our goal is to make the financially motivated fraudsters just have a much harder time doing this in music. And eventually they'll go back to PayPal or wherever they were before, right? Like it doesn't have to be, um, we're, not tra we're not solving fraud on the internet. Our goal is not so utopian as to say like, we're gonna make the internet, uh, you know, just all kumbaya and, and, and legitimate payouts. It's more just, sure. let's make music a really, really tough target. And the folks who are financially motivated will go somewhere else. The little bit that's left is what we've just been talking about, the artists who are trying to cut through the noise inadvertently or intentionally. Um, and they respond to a different set of incentives. So it's about education and it's about making sure that people know buying streams can be a career limiting move if you do it intentionally. And that's the last thing you want. There are lots of other ways to market yourself. So for us, it's, it's sort of two things. It's how good can we get? How fast can we do this? Can we solve the financial problem you know, as, as deeply as possible? And then can we spend a lot of time, you know, helping educate artists on basically don't do this right there's there's do anything else but don't buy streams because the better we get the faster you get caught the more likely this will have a detrimental effect on your career and that's the last thing anybody wants yep yep cool um well and now i don't know if this is correct but i feel like i read this somewhere uh andrew are you behind the artist urban outlaws is this uh is this is this a true <laughs> statement this did is you, true did you come out it is true. And you came out with the song Drink and Drinks. I did. I, uh, I, uh, I, you know, what's interesting is I feel like 
back in the day, a good fr- uh, my mentor was Tony Shea, who's former founder of Zappos. He kind of like really pushed on me customer centric and really focusing on customers. And I feel like as we built this and we went really B two B and enterprise, I sort of lost touch with what it's like to be an artist. And so what I wanted to do was put a collective together. Now I'm not a great artist, period, and I know that. But I thought, I wonder if I get a collective of people together so I could go through the process of being an artist and see where our technology could be implemented and where all the sort of pitfalls are. And we, we, so I got a bunch of people together. We did this, this song. Um, you know, we, uh, we launched it. We decided to give all the money to Music Care. So even the label, um, you know, we were signed under Universal uh, Canada. They, uh, you know, one of their sub labels, they, they gave all their money to Music Cares. We gave our money to Music Cares. Um, and we ended up, uh, you know, we ended up charting. We were the number four U.S. single the week that we launched uh, in country, um, which was like, super song. cool. This song this behind song? Morgan Wall, and yeah, it was like Morgan Wall and Luke Combs. Uh, oh wow, who else was ahead of us? Um, we only charted for a week. The great example was you can do whatever you want for trying to break out, but at the end of the day, if you're not touring, I think the thing I try to tell people is like. What I learned in this experience was I used to be really great at creating exposure, uh, breaking artists. That's what I did. I broke artists in the in the you know 2000s. And I was very confident I could break us. But I had no yeah. plan for what happens after. <laughs> like, what do you do <laughs> after you're there? And I actually, because in the past, you'd break and then you either took or you didn't take. Like, we broke and then I had no plan for how to, like, collect fans and deal with fans. And, like, you know, we just sort of went nowhere after so it was like a really valuable learning experience for me on just how much harder it is i think because we got lots of attention we were on wild country we got playlisted by the 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 spotify playlist editors there we were on all the new music sort of like playlists everywhere um you know it was a i i and it's funny when we made the song i'm like i just want a straight up the middle country song that you could wake surf with your friends with like it's not supposed to be i'm not trying to win a grammy here it's just like let's just have a fun song we could all like vibe with it's just supposed to be a vibe and that was the that was the plan and and i think that's what we delivered and uh but i learned a ton i learned about how difficult it is i just wanted to go on the artist journey the hero's journey and just feel like what is it like to be an artist you know i had to run all of our own promo even though the the major you know even though they helped us get it out um we had to do all of our own marketing and all of our, like, I basically felt like an independent artist trying to go through this process. And, you know, there's nothing like not being talented and hearing your voice back for the first time in a recording session and realizing you are not, you're not the man you thought you were. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, it, was, it was very humbling. The whole yeah. experience. So did you run into any of these uh, fraud issues? Did you get flagged for any? I mean, you have uh, 370,000 yeah. Spotify streams alone just on this, this just on Spotify. Yeah, we got most of those in the first week or two. Uh, and then obviously a, some trailing from the, the playlisting. I think the two things I was surprised by was that we, you know, we got playlisted on Wild Country, for example, at like number 32 or something like in the in the list. And I really thought it would have drove more streams. It didn't drive as many streams as I was expecting from all these playlists. I actually thought it would be like a slam dunk for millions. It did, it did, I was very surprised that that's not – I had a very big gap of knowledge there around like what that equals. Uh, yeah. So I think that was a learning curve. Um, and yeah, I, I think um, – sorry, I forgot the, question, the rest of the question. Uh, oh, well, did you run into any uh, fraud issues or oh, I feel like I read yeah. – yeah. Yeah, I went to a bunch of fan clubs that that I knew, and I said, you know, from from some other uh, fan engagement apps and stuff like that, and I said, hey, like, would you support this song? The money's going to charity. Can you help stream it? So we, you know, before I launched, my strategy was always whenever I launched artists, I thought, what's the one asset that you have that no one else has? What's your edge? And then you build the entire vehicle for the launch around that asset. So in this case, I had 12 fan clubs that agreed to support me. It was like, or the whole collective. So it was like, you know, the BTS uh, army and like some, it's not them directly, but some of the, the sub sub fan groups, it was like the black pink people. Um, some of the, um, a lot of K-pop groups were helping uh, like the Nicki Minaj, like a bunch of random fan clubs who just knew us and liked us and said, we'll support you anyway. So on the day that we launched, we actually had over a million fans like organized to, to go and start streaming and wow. helping promote our song. We had, it was the first time I've ever been rate limited on Twitter 
where like the entire Twitter feed just like rate limited me because we were being retweeted and shared so many times when we launched. Wow. It was wild. Um, cool. and, and I think that was the asset, but what looked like was fraud. So I remember, right. I remember logging into my Spotify for artists and seeing the streams and all of a sudden there was one page that I'd left open and I could see it keep going up, but the other pages when I refreshed had locked into a number and I realized we had been flagged as fraud because it looked, it must've looked strange. I released a country song and it's like similar artist BTS and black pink. Right. People must've been like, <laughs> what is happening right now? This looks yeah. so crazy. And it was a hundred percent legit. Like these are real fans playing the song. We had just right. sort of weaponized them early and sort of coordinated them early to say on this date, we all want you to help us. Cause my goal was to push them in the same week so that we could chart. And I was hoping yep. that would be enough to propel us forward. That's why yes. I learned it's not enough. That's the learning lesson was like, you actually need a plan for week two through you know right. 12 or 16 or 56. But I just was like, you know, I only had them in that one week, but it, it looked highly suspicious. We were flagged. Um, and I had to struggle the same way that, that you guys struggle. Like, I, you know, I was like, hey, I'm reaching out to the label saying this isn't fraud. Can you proactively get ahead of it? Can someone talk to someone on, on the team there and let them know this isn't fraud? Um, and they ended up releasing, releasing our streams back and letting us go. But I, there was an investigation there. I didn't use any of our beat app relationships. I, I really, truly wanted to, um, go through the experience sort of in a church and state, like without, without sort of, you know, without a leg up to kind of see where, where yeah. this ended up, but ended up all of our streams ended up being validated. Obviously they were real. It just looked strange. It's like one of, that's why I said earlier, it's one of those things you could do something so out of the box no one probably right. thought to go reach out to a bunch of K-pop fan right. clubs and ask them for help <laughs> right. in a country track. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, and everyone thought it was crazy when I did, they're like, why would they help you? Like, this is so stupid. And they all agreed and helped me. So like, you know, it was the, the Harry Styles, like fan club is really big, like one direct, they helped a ton. And so, yeah. I don't know. It was just, it, it looked so weird in the data for sure. And I, sure. and like, I, I didn't question why it flagged because, like, I, I'm looking at it at, on the artist page, going like, "This is definitely not going to look good." <laughs> like, yeah, you know, like, yeah, 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 like yeah. I'm looking at it, going like, "It would flag for us too," you know, like this. Yeah. This is like not. No, great. no, that makes sense. So that make that that makes a lot of sense of like where you said if you get too creative, you know, that that's a perfect example of of how you can get flagged. Now that's, you know, that's great for if the intention is to chart or to get a big, uh, you know, bump right away, but like. Yeah, it's going to mess up the algorithm if if all these streaming services think that your similar fan, you know, similar artists are are K-pop artists and Harry Styles, which has nothing to do with that. So that that's the long term <laughs> issue that you're talking about is like what comes after the fact. But OK, cool. Well, that that's that's a fun story. And that's super helpful. Um, so like if if a label indie labels are out there or even majors or, or anyone that is like, oh, I need this help. Like I, I need to, you know, is that like, do you, do you do your services? Like are, are labels, some of your customers as well is like, is this like a, a tool that people can, can hire you to do? Or how does this, how does that work? Do, do label, you work with labels as well? Yeah, we, we can work for the, like labels, but the, the one challenge, like, the way that we would work with a label is almost like a catalog health check, but they don't get nearly as descriptive of a data set as obviously the first party that comes from a streaming service and it's limited to their own repertoire. So in some ways it's like we're, our data science team is checking for the most obvious examples of suspicious activity within a fairly limited data set when we look at a label's data. It's better for us to work at the DSP or the distributor or the sort of collection society level where they're looking across the entirety of a data set, but we're happy to chat with sort of anyone on the label side who has, you know, even questions just about like the behavior of their own, um, of their own artists or their own, you know, looking at their own data and just want an extra set of sort of trained eyes. Um, we're always happy to do that. It's not like the sort of core business, but it's interesting for us too. Um, and we, you know, I think over time we'll hopefully be able to do more work in that sort of audit space for labels. Um, cool. Yeah. Cool. Well, this has been super fascinating and I appreciate you guys kind of coming on and, and breaking this down. Uh, man, it is uh, it is the wild, wild west out there. If, like we thought it was crazy. You know, I thought it was crazy five years ago when, when this was really coming. This is this is nuts. I mean, this is some of the stuff that like I did not understand. I think most people you've really blown a lot of people's minds uh, during this conversation. That's just like the, the, they've 
the scammers have gotten uh, real creative. Um, and uh, so, yeah. So anyway, um, well, I have one final question that I ask everybody who comes on the show, and I'd love to hear uh, your answer to this. Uh, what does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? I have more of a like macro level approach. I For me, um, making it is doing something you love that you can sustain your career on. You know, like I have a good friend of mine, family friend. He was actually the first one to give us music. Uh, he's, he's the lead singer front man of this band called the expendables. And, you know, like, no, like he's got such a core fan group. He still sells shows out of him. He's touring constantly. Mm -hmm. You know, he'll never, I, I don't, I don't know his financial situation. My guess is he'll never be super rich, but he has a sustainable career and a passion and in the industry of something he loves. Like to me, that's making it. Can you have a sustainable long-term career uh, in doing something you love. Like to me, that that's the bar. I like that answer a lot. I, I think for, for me, it's, you know, I, I get so much from music, you know, like my personal life and uh, to build a business that can just try to give something back in, you know, a meaningful way to the, the artists and the labels and the managers and all the people behind the scenes and behind the mixing boards and everywhere else that are um, actually creating the art and to do something to just hopefully ensure the viability of, of their careers over the long term and build a business around that, it, it, that's making it. It's, it's just awesome for us, you know, to get to give back to an industry that's given so much and gives so much to us. Yeah. So that's amazing. Yeah. Morgan, Andrew, thank you guys so much. This is great. Thanks, Ari. Thank it's you. It's been a pleasure. It's been fun. Today's episode was edited by Mikey Evans with music by Brassroots District and produced by all the great people at Ari's Take.